you know, a bunch of different products. So you're, you're developing in <laughs> India your your your. No, your I, ha I have I have companies uh, in different places. Okay. Yeah, in the U.S. <laughs> in the, uh, and I, I work a lot in developing. Uh, you should you should be you should be healthcare here. programs, <laughs> China, India, Africa, Latin America. Everything is about making things affordable and accessible by, by being in control. Great, of yeah. Andrew. Of all aspects. Yeah. Of so maybe uh, you can share your more pleasure. information about your product. I think the China is uh, a huge demand. Yes. I did same kind of thing in China. Yeah. Uh, we produce uh, all the medical equipment, uh, CDM, uh, ultrasound, right. X-ray, yeah. and uh, this moment. We try Welcome. To internet to connect. To Thanks for joining in this early afternoon. Uh, this session part of the public program on the health advantage. Uh, in a minute, our moderator, Lee Yadsen, will uh, present our guest, so I won't go there. And I uh, would like to discuss the term advantage. Advantage. We know those numbers very well. USA, $8,000 in terms of annual cost per individual. 79 year old life expectancy, 18% of GDP. China, 75 year old, $275 per individual. Well, actually in actual dollars, because it was in 1990 dollars, it's closer to 400. Still less than 500. 5% of GDP. Singapore, 4% of GDP, 83-year-old life expectancy. Does it matter? Does it matter? Well, from an employer's standpoint, if you can't recruit the best talent because you can't afford to offer the best insurance program, it matters. For a city, if you rank very low in the ranking of the best livable city of the world because your healthcare system is not the one people would expect when they migrate, it matters. For states, when your healthcare system is going to result in high level of absenteeism, disability, reduced output, productivity loss, it matters. We estimate the direct cost of healthcare expenses worldwide to be $7 trillion. And now that we've worked on that before, we think the true cost of healthcare is $47 trillion when you take into consideration the indirect cost of not providing healthcare at the right level and the, and the, and the elements I just mentioned. We estimate that in the US alone, the productivity loss due to the absenteeism is $250 billion. For a company of 1,000 employees in the US, the cost of obesity is $280,000 annually. So it is time to rethink the healthcare systems. It is time to find new ways of building them or rebuilding them. And my expectation from the session is that our panelists should cover, and I think they will, how can we integrate innovation seamlessly into existing healthcare systems? How can we work in multi-stakeholder ecosystems along the continuum of care. What about business model innovation? Innovative financing. And let's not forget regulatory systems that have to promote innovation as well as safety. With no further ado, I pass on to you. Thank you very much, Arnaud. And uh, let you introduce our guest. Do I need the microphone? I'm not no. sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Arnold, and welcome, um, ladies and gentlemen. Arnold did a terrific job of, um, of introducing the topic. I think he's done the first part of my job 
uh, for me. Um, but let me start then by introducing um, the panel. We have a, we have a terrific panel um, here today. We're very fortunate to have with us um, the um, Health Minister of Malaysia, uh, Dr. Subara, uh, with us. Welcome, uh, Dr. Subara. Um, we have... We have David Green, who's the founder of Oralab um, India and a uh, Swab Foundation uh, fellow. Uh, David, welcome. Uh, we have Andrew Lee, who's the Vice President, Northeast Region Aetna um, from the United States. We have Gordon Liu, who's the Director of the China Centre for Health Economics Research, the National School of Development from Peking University. And welcome. Um, and last but not least, we have Mr Liu Jiren, who's the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of NewSoft Corporation from China. Um, welcome. Uh, to you all. Just in terms of housekeeping, though, we're going to have a conversation here for about half an hour, and then we're going to throw it open um, to you guys uh, to ask whatever questions of any one of the panelists or to, or to all of us um, that you want as well, so we can make this um, as interactive um, as possible. But um, let me kick off and um, ask you, uh, Dr. Subra, um, the situation in Malaysia, you know, what is the Malaysian government uh, doing? What is your ministry uh, doing in terms of um, implementing universal health care in Malaysia? What are some of the challenges uh, that, that you are facing? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Uh, uh, as you know, this is the third session on health and speaking in this forum, each with different uh, titles to it. The first one was entitled Economy and Health. The second one was leapfrogging over health. <laughs> and now we are meeting advantage in health. <laughs> so we essentially, it's all the same. Whether, and uh, the material is going to be the same. Uh, to start off with, Malaysia has uh, sort of assured uh, universal health coverage through the public health system. Uh, this has been done since independence, so we have, in, in terms of principle, all Malaysians are entitled to free health care through the public service system. So when you look at that, then uh, the three areas in which we probably to, to look at it, one is, of course, access, uh, second is affordability, and third is quality. If you talk about access, I think uh, we are fortunate through a very uh, extensive network of both the public health service and, uh, and also an equally widespread availability of private health services. Uh, there is good access to health care. Uh, for all Malaysians, we have got uh, a primary health clinic in, uh, where for every 50,000 population with five feeder clinics which feed to this main clinic. So uh, we have met access. We have met affordability because public health is 98% subsidized by the government. So anybody who has got no money has got access to public health service. But how, how affordable is it for the government? Oh, that's the other issue. That's what I'm coming to, the third issue. <laughs> the third part is the quality. So that is where, of course, when you provide a service which is so extensive, so widespread, uh, then you have to meet qualities in expectation of the people, not as defined by the government. So when that comes, of course, that is, I think, it's our biggest challenge in terms of whether we can meet up to the expectations of the people in terms of waiting time, in terms of giving them the correct kind of technology, and, of course, making sure that all forms of ailments which they have can be treated according to the current uh, knowledge of medicine and science. I think that probably is our biggest challenge, and that's the challenge we are trying to meet with, and that probably will answer your question. And uh, I won't give you the answer now because we're in the process of transforming and finding an answer to that question. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Gordon, um, China and Malaysia, and I guess you come from a, from a university um, perspective. When I look at the Chinese health system now, and, and you know, my staff, for instance, will start queuing in the morning at five o'clock in the morning to attend a hospital because they have a cold. Um, so this emphasis on hospitals and tertiary care that strikes me as tremendously inefficient. From your perspective, what's, what's happening in China and how can China sort of break through some of these challenges and some of these barriers? <clears throat> well, the, the healthcare system in China has been long uh, concentrated at the hospital, at the center of the service system. In other words, in China, there is no gatekeeper for people to uh, obtain the health care for their common conditions, like cold conditions in the community settings. 
Uh, instead, most people, if possible, would all go to tertiary hospitals for, uh, for all conditions. That is because uh, the way we allocate the resources, which are highly concentrated at tertiary hospital, that's our, our problem, that's our challenge. That's why you, you would see the long queue uh, in, in almost all hospitals uh, for any conditions. So the, the, I think our goal is to change the way that services are delivered uh, from the hospital-centered system to primary care centered in community settings and only have the patients who need the inpatient care going to the hospitals. That's our challenge. That's our job. I want to come back to that a bit later and the challenges around that, but yeah. obviously some of the things that enable what you're talking about, <clears throat> the community delivery of healthcare, is right. obviously technology. I wanted to throw to um, Mr. Liu here uh, uh, now in terms of what, what your company is doing, uh, your technology company, a software company, and you're very involved in healthcare technology. Is there a, is there a linkage here in terms of the technology solutions that, you, that you're putting into the market? I think that is uh, that's a linkage uh, between uh, the central uh, community, uh, the hospital with a community uh, clinic or, or uh, hospital services, uh, healthcare services in a community. The reason is that is uh, now <coughs> most uh, why the people come to a big hospital is because uh, all the best doctor is very much centralized. It's not only in big hospital, also in best city. Most in best doctor in China, they live in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou. The second tier, that means our quality of healthcare is second, second level. And the rural areas, we have a barefoot doctor. So many of doctors is not very much uh, adequate. Like so, myself. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so that means uh, in China, you can say every people is a doctor. Uh, if they are very hard to access a public health or a hospital, they can buy the drugs, they can handle you know, that, uh, some kind of trouble by himself. So now as a technology company, our mission is we try to use the digital technology to connect big hospital with small community hospital. We want to convert those kind of knowledge or you know, the very, very limited resources to be sharing by everybody. So, we use the internet, we're sharing all big data. We use uh, cloud as a platform to connect each of individual, each of uh, uh, small hospital, we build a group. I, I gave them a name called coordinate medicine. So that means not uh, just one single uh, hospital to, to face to face provide a kind of services. It can build a kind of community like a more doctor working together and uh, for that kind of purpose, just like uh, Dr. Liu mentioned about that, we can, like a different uh, kind of condition, we come to right place. Mm. So right place means uh, right cost. So that is uh, technology can, can drive mm. uh, those kind of transformation of uh, healthcare system of China. But technology can't solve everything, right? I mean, um, I think some of the things you've talked about earlier go to trust. Yeah. Uh, people just don't trust the, the the barefoot doctors, like, yeah. like Gordon um, here. 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so technology in itself doesn't solve um, trust. Um, I, I wanted to throw to, 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 to David here now um, and, and to us. So you're a social entrepreneur now in, in, in India. You, you were um, uh, in the commercial sector before you developed you know, products. I wanted to ask you about you know, the role of... of the civil society, the role of the of social entrepreneurs um, in this space, but particularly, I want to ask you about trust. Um, you know, how do you build trust in at the grassroots level? If somebody thinks the only way I think I can be confident I get good quality healthcare is to go by, go to this enormous big hospital that's had millions of dollars put into it, how does somebody trust a a, a local primary care facility? Well, my, my background is mainly in, in eye care, and so <coughs> by providing a good uh, outcome to surgery, principally cataract surgery, and providing that service uh, where free is the lowest price, um, that's what creates the buzz in the marketplace. So if, if, the, if the farmer working on my land, if his mother gets a good result, 
from cataract surgery, then yes, of course, I'm going to go to Aravind Eye Hospital also. So, uh, but it, it, it has to do with, with quality, uh, pricing, and access. So um, I've been working for many years um, developing both um, hospitals, primarily eye hospitals, but also technology companies and financing. And so uh, I've helped develop maybe over 300 eye hospitals uh, that have become self-financing and do over a million surgeries per year. Um, by contrast, China only does about a million cataract surgeries a year. Uh, at Aravind Eye Hospital in South India, uh, they do about 400,000 surgeries a year uh, through their network in Tamil Nadu, South, South India. And uh, they have a system where free is the lowest price. 50% pay well above cost, 25% uh, are free, 25% pay two-thirds cost, and yet they're able to have a, uh, a profit margin of 38%. So we've, we've spread this model to different uh, mentoring, training institutions. They are, have become living laboratories, which then help other eye care programs uh, develop similarly. One of them is here in China, uh, which I helped develop, the, the Her Eye System in Liaoning Province which does between 40 and 50,000 cataract surgeries a year. So in, in, um, uh, coupled with that service delivery model, we've focused on bringing down the cost of the products used in eye care. So in 1992, we set up Aura Lab to make interocular lenses and then suture, pharmaceuticals, surgical blades, other ophthalmic equipment. And so we, we dramatically lowered the, the cost of the consumables and at the same time, we started creating training programs in the better surgical technique, going from cataract surgery without interocular lens, where the patient would be given thick cataract glasses, which 50% would lose or break within a year, to the surgically implanted lens, restoring good vision. And what happened was that this combination of, of affordable products, creating training programs, um, not just uh, surgical, but clinical, managerial, outreach, business planning, pricing. We were able to bring about a revolution in India. So um, Aura Lab, when it started in 1992, India was doing something like 800,000 cataract surgeries a year. A lot of other companies came in and started uh, competing with Aura Lab, and they actually drove Aura Lab's price down from from $10 a lens, at, at, at a time when we started, it was $300 a lens. They, they drove our price down today to what it is, $2 a lens for the lowest price lens. But in the meantime, India's surgical volume went from 800,000 in 92 to over 5 million by the new century, and now it's leveled off at 6 million, very much due to this price competitive market. China, again, by contrast, only does a million surgeries. So when, when I think about what's to be exported to other countries, especially the United States, it's this idea of price competition. In the United States, there is no price competition. There's no price transparency. And that's why the health system costs so much. OK, but is that going to work? So you've, you've just talked about business model here. And it's a business model that seems to work for that type of company in, a, in an emerging market. I mean, I'm interested in the big company sort of view here. Can you guys do something like that? And how would you feel? if these highly entrepreneurial companies from emerging markets came into developed markets with extremely price competitive technologies and product offerings? What's that going to do to, to, to the status quo? Well, we, you know, in the United States, we're in a system that's in the midst of transformation right now. And, and frankly, I think that kind of innovation is exactly the kind of the prescription that the United States needs. Um, one of the lessons I would say that emerging markets really ought to take from the United States experience is that don't replicate it. You know, there's so many flaws in the United U.S. healthcare system that, that uh, for emerging markets to look at the developed uh, healthcare systems is probably a mistake. And so there are probably many more lessons to avoid than there are things to embrace. Now, I would say that because the U.S. healthcare system is in this period of transformation, we're actually starting to see the kind of innovation that you're talking about. And, and that's actually very exciting. And when I think about uh, a high performance healthcare system, I really think about a couple of things. Number one is this sort of shift toward population health management. So instead of just managing the individual patient, you think about how to manage outcomes for an entire population. So that's 
I think, a, a wonderful concept that emerging markets ought to be looking at. The second thing uh, is, is really around health information technology. The United States, we have $800 billion of waste. I mean, it's an incredible amount. And I think some of the emerging economies, they have an opportunity to eliminate some of that waste. And a big role, a big driver of that is going to be through health information technology that essentially turns data, big data, into knowledge that can be used to drive out excess and inefficiency in, in the marketplace. And then the third thing I, I would touch on in terms of thinking about a high performance system is something that we haven't touched on, but I think weighs on all of our countries enormously, which is the rise of chronic disease. Mm. You know, 63% of all deaths around the world are due to chronic disease. And uh, we need to open our eyes and think creatively about how to design systems that address the problem of chronic disease. Because unless we tackle that and we continue to sort of treat uh, uh, patients in the acute setting, if we're not treating chronic disease, we're all in for a big surprise. And I think very much that we need to think about how to design systems that are going to work for the people in the future. And it's things like transparency. It's things like having competitiveness at the right levels rather than at the wrong levels. It's about changing incentive systems. And it's about dealing with uh, uh, medical professional shortages, which China and many other uh, countries around the world are really grappling, grappling with. That's great. Let's see where this goes. You guys take it, take it where you want to go. Yeah, I, 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 I want to uh, comment on your uh, first point. I can't agree more on the on a transition from what we called disease-based medical care system to a health management system. Because this is a really important key to solve many kinds of problems that healthcare system faces. For example, in China in October 2013, the state council issued a very important policy call for such a transition from disease-based medical care system to health management system, which would expand uh, the medical care services to two sites. On the one hand, it, to, to extend the services to serve not only the patients, but also people who are not sick yet. But we have a lot of things to do to maintain their health status. Okay? And also, we can extend the services to the right-hand side to provide services for those uh, people who just finished their surgical treatment, but they don't have to stay in hospital for post-treatment post services. But China does not have formal sectors to take over these people. So if we can make this transition from disease-based medical care system to health management system, I think that's going to be very, very powerful uh, policy transition for both healthcare system and for economic transition. Now, I also just want to make one more point to our... Uh, uh, our Dao's leader, uh, he mentioned that um, uh, you know, the worldwide uh, spend too much money out of GDP on healthcare. For example, in the US, we spend about 18% of GDP on healthcare. You know, to me, I would not worry too much about how much we spend in total out of GDP on healthcare. What I would worry is what we would spend these money for. Okay, so, so you know, the services uh, are, are different. We really have to prioritize what kind of technology, what kind of services should be included with the first priority. So we would encourage people to use those services that are more cost effective than others. As long as we hold a cost effectiveness basis to prioritize the medical services including technology as drugs, I think I would not worry how much we spend. Even if we spend 30% of GDP on health, that's fine with me. But if we waste a lot of money on those unnecessary technologies, even if we spend less than 10%, I would worry much about it. <laughs> Just to take up on this point, I mean, what you said, I think this is an issue I think we have repeatedly re-emphasized in this uh, forum over the last two days, is I think health cannot be used, uh, seen as a uh, an entity which just belongs to the confines of the Ministry of Health itself, but to be looked at as a broader perspective of the entire government uh, to, to, an, uh, to ensure the ecosystem of health. And when you talk, talk about the ecosystem of health, it involves uh, 
of course, uh, anything from environment to sanitation to city planning uh, to laws and legislations on nutrition and food uh, down to the provision of facilities. So I think that will take us to what you said just now, to, to prevent. And I think to, to prevent diseases, that's where our investment is to come, is to ensure that the proper ecosystem is provided so that it actually generates a community based on principles of health in which disease is actually put far away. Certainly in the context of um, chronic disease, yes. you need an ecosystem approach because it's not just killing a bug. Right? It's a much more complex, it's a much more complex um, um, issue. Any other contributions on this, on this I line? Just, of I would just want to pick up on what Dr. Liu said. You know, we think about the continuum of care. And today we have a really fragmented system. I think that's more the rule than the exception around the globe. We tend to think of healthcare in very particular silos, right? So we think of physical health, mental health, behavioral health, emotional. You know, we think of things in silos. And I think, you know, as we look to the future, we need to very aggressively just destroy those silos and think about the continuum of care. Everything from stay, you know, staying healthy and preventing disease to dealing with acute care when you do get sick, all the way to sort of end of life care. We need to think of it very holistically. Okay, so who's we, right? So everybody, we're self-interested actors, different people have different incentives. We talked about prevention. So if we have a preventative system, big drug companies are gonna go out of business. So who's we, who drives this agenda? Well, one, one um, stakeholder that we haven't mentioned yet, but I think plays an absolutely vital role in, in the high performance health system is the consumer himself or herself. Yes. And that's where sort of technology can really take hold. Yeah. You know, if you think about the, the rise of technology, more people have access to mobile phones than they have access to toilets today. And that's just a, you know, that's a shocking example, but it tells you that the future may lie in sort of personalized technology in making it easy for patients and consumers to get price information, to get quality information about either facilities or their doctors, and make it very easy for them to keep themselves healthy so they can avoid going into the hospital for the acute care. So I think the consumer or the patient, the end user, plays an absolutely vital role in this. We, we really have to understand the statistical distribution of patient population and healthy population are not independent. They are correlated highly. In other words, if we can treat the patients through medical care system, in the meantime, we can also serve healthy population with health services. So our customers are not only patients, but the entire population. We can keep the patient population as small as possible, as delayed as possible. Right. Otherwise, you know, you, your pa patient population may become larger and larger, sooner and sooner. These two populations are not independently distributed. Right. Most uh, governments or insurance schemes don't pay for prevention. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to get covered. My sense is, you know, if, you've, if you look at a country's disease profile, it's the 80-20 rule. Where, you know, where's 20% where's of the disease uh, concentration? You know, what 20% are, what are of diseases affect 80% of the population? A lot of it's cardiovascular. Or like in, in my case, you know, in, in eye care, it's cataract and now increasingly becoming diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration. And I think that uh, the, the approach that I take and I work in many different countries, including the United States, is to, to look at um, uh, vertical integration. Like uh, if, if you take a procedure like uh, a pacemaker for arrhythmias, um, I, I worked with Medtronic in India to look at how you uh, broaden the reach to lower income Indians with, uh, pay, you know, that, that, that have arrhythmias in need of pacemakers. You have to create a whole uh, community surveillance system to pick up the arrhythmias before they show up half dead at the hospital. You have to figure out how you bring down the, the, uh, the price of the pacemaker, the price of the procedure. We looked at how we do uh, cons uh, retail financing to make it affordable. And what, 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 I get, what I got out of that whole experience working with, um, uh, the, it's, it's, it's possible to lower the cost. The, the real value of competition is creating players 
that force the industry to lower their price points. Uh, medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, doctors will not lower their price point unless you're competing with them. Uh, I have an example, o Oral Lab beat out a major uh, company, I won't mention its name, on a suture contract. It's, it's a company that makes 90% of the world's suture. Uh, they, they sued us, they lost, they appealed, they won, and, uh, and then we took it to the Indian Supreme Court and ultimately won that case uh, but in the meantime, they lowered their price point from $240 for a box of suture to $23 in order to beat us out on the next bid. <coughs> so that's, that's the power of competition. When, when I look at uh, just about any medical device, when you, uh, when you demystify cost and then uh, deconstruct supply chains and take out all the non-value added margin and add it up, it's better than cocaine, it's better than heroin margins, it's better than marijuana margins. So this is, this is a sort of demystification that somebody has to do. And um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get governments to get into us. I, I tried to get US state governments looking at um, you know, um, Medicaid paying out for durable medical equipment and supplies. I, I had their data, I analyzed it, and I said, you're, you're paying 10 times what, what it would cost in a competitive market. Um, so, but they, they didn't want to upset the apple cart of special interest. I, uh, you know, we, we're talking about uh, the cost, uh, maybe the cost uh, from, uh, you know, very expensive uh, check and uh, uh, medical uh, treatment. But I think the people from a customer point, they don't care about payment, they care about uh, outcome, the quality of the services. Now, if we look at uh, what is the reason like uh, people waste uh, the money, the first point is the doctor like an artist. You know, each of them is uh, individual. So hospital to hospital, doctor to doctor, everything is isolated. They don't sharing about knowledge. They don't sharing about data. So many of our waste is because uh, people recheck. And uh, they come to one hospital to another hospital, the people have just like uh, you mentioned about, there's not continual data to like a uh, doctor have a clear picture to say what is their condition from first day to today. They come to different hospital, the doctor asks the same kind of questions. In China, take a very long line, given uh, 40 minutes, uh, ask 20 minutes questions. And then second day you come in and repeat again. So because not any data can recording the you know the that the that the conditions the situation and changing everything. So I think that based on that point, we solve that problem. The firstly, we must be sharing that data. That is a big challenge. Secondly, we must build for every people, everybody have their personal health care record. That should be integrated with a hospital. It's like a doctor can use daily the data or lifestyle data or a lot of questions from their home, not just in the moment come to a hospital. So that is a big challenge because each of hospital, like an individual, you know, the, the company, they compete with each other, they don't want sharing each other. So, okay. uh, but today we can say it's a big change, it's driven by technology. The first thing we really, really can got more and more personal healthcare information. Yesterday, uh, you see the Apple announced new technology about phone. They embedded a lot of lifestyle the apps to the phone. That means if you, you carry your phone every day, you can got all the, uh, your lifestyle, your activity, everything is exactly very much available for uh, diagnostic for the future. The secondly, Internet gave more and more opportunity, like we call coordinate the medicine. So that means diagnostic is not from an individual doctor. So if you really have problem, you can like uh, many hundred doctor. You can you can given those kind of data to the doctor in Beijing, maybe U.S. So maybe you know we call integrated medicine. Before you have a one med problem. You, you find some doctor is very much a focus on very niche, the areas. But uh, when you solve that problem, you got another problem. But now, the internet make that possible. 
Let, right. let's, let's go to that area if there's no other intervention. No, just uh, responding to what Liu said, I think uh, it is true that we are transiting from a period in which medical data was uh, considered a very private document uh, where the medical doctor was held ownership to it uh, to a situation where technology will probably dictate that it becomes the ownership of the individual because previously we never had the technology. And it's very interesting, yesterday in the Ideas Lab, under which was sponsored by the National University of Singapore, where we actually discussed uh, a concept called the virtual uh, individual patient's health concierge, where in every, every individual patient uh, will have his own data record of, uh, of uh, health, including the risk factors, uh, concomitant of the genetic makeup, and the behavioral element of the individual uh, from birth to death, and how at any, at any point you actually can intervene and actually suggest what are the risk factors which you're going to have at different stage and how to modify it. So I think uh, it, was, it is not an impossibility, as what we discussed yesterday. It was not an impossibility. Even we discussed the, the modalities which are put to cause the behavioral changes which are reduce the risk factor. I think these are things which, which will come into uh, we, by virtue of technology. I think I foresee a day where medical profession as such uh, has to recognize that records are no more sacred to them, but it's something which will own to the patient, and uh, the patient will have a right to contain it, and that will probably dictate the changes which is required upon them to make the changes. Yeah. Very good. Right. Let's um, I propose we open it up a little bit uh, now, if people are happy. So we're taking questions from the floor. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and I think the helpers uh, will put a mic, put a mic in your hand <clears throat> over here. And then here, and let's just start with those two. Okay. Norbert Hultenschmidt. Yeah, it works. Let's work. Norbert Hultenschmidt from Bain. I have a little bit of a provocative question, actually, because you haven't touched on it. And the key question would be, if I'm a consumer, and again, I'm not a patient, would I trust the doctor, that the, that the doctor really has a good understanding of what health means to me? Um, would I really believe, you know, that the medical profession doesn't need to change as well? And would I actually go to a hospital which still has a little bit the stigma of disease? So I think this is one of the key barriers that I would at least see uh, in terms of transitioning from a paradigm shift from disease to health. What is your view on this? Take well, why don't I start and ask others to join in? So I think quality has, at least in the context of the United States, quality has been largely shielded from the consumer. So it's very difficult to know hospital outcomes, doctor quality, you know, and, and at the same time, what you see happening is variation from clinical guidelines. And I think big data can play a key role in starting to eliminate that, because as you have these terabytes of data about uh, cl clinical uh, pathways, you can start to create best practices. And I think consumers ought to be holding their providers or their healthcare professionals accountable to maintaining and, and, and adhering to those clinical best practices or guidelines. But I think it really begins with uh, this question of transparency. Uh, where if you can introduce transparency into the system, suddenly people start paying attention. Uh, because today, in the United States, it's very difficult to have any idea about the quality of the institution or the individual practitioner. I, I think uh, the trust between doctors and a general population, not necessarily patient, must be based on mutual understanding of modern medicine. See, what is the role of modern medicine? How much medicine can really do for the health? How much medicine cannot do for our health? I mean, in the medical literature, it is very well known that medical technology, medical intervention itself, can only contribute at most somewhere 10 to 15% of health determination. Individual behavior contribute at least 50 or 60 percent. So as long as we both said understand that knowledge, then the trust that can be built. As long as we, the healthcare um, sector, the government sector, can transform, promote that information to general population, I think trust 
as a basis to be developed. Any other tight groups? There was a question over back here. Yeah. My question is for David Green, but I'd appreciate the inputs from the others. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by the uh, successes of Oralab and, uh, and the Aravind model and the deconstruction of the pricing chain. And I'm wondering if you could speculate in almost your wildest imagination, what would be other targets of the top two or three uh, enormously inefficient uh, but very important devices or practices where that kind of treatment could be impactful? Uh, pacemakers, stents, uh, and um, knees and hips, hip joints. I, if, if, if you look at um, any um, medical device realm, there's anywhere from two to five players. They have, you know, the, they have bought up other companies and there's um, unspoken price fixing and that's how they maintain very high pricing. So that's, that's where competition is needed. Uh, so I would, I would say those are the main ones. Um, I have another company that's making an affordable hearing aid. Um, we, we figured out how to demedicalize the fitting of hearing aids. Uh, we, we have an app on a smartphone or a computer where you, that you can download and wirelessly test your hearing uh, in just a few minutes and then it automatically programs the device and we're, we're selling this and I'm, I'm actually wearing them for like $80 and the, the, the technology is on par with uh, hearing aids that cost between two and three thousand dollars a piece and again it's because of uh, unspoken price fixing there's only five players serving the, uh, the you know 95 percent of the market and they, they keep prices high artificially. And hearing is a really important uh, arena to address from a public health point of view. Um, uh, Frank Lynn at Hopkins shows that uh, hearing loss is directly related to cognitive decline. So as, your, um, as, your, as your, your decibels go down, so does your cognition. And so this is a, this is a major public health problem. There's only seven million hearing aids sold each year, and yet 600 million people could benefit from a hearing aid. That's 1.2 uh, billion ears, since most people have bilateral hearing loss. So these are just, you know, if you, if you look at any medical device, and I think it's probably the same with pharmaceuticals, and you see that it really doesn't cost that much to make, then you can make it affordably. Yeah, I, I would have a question, David. I, mean, I don't. I would like to play David's advocate on this one for, for, for a little while because you know what the argument you is going to be so used. You can do so at your own risk. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and we'll continue the dialogue afterwards. <laughs> now, it's just, just, just to take also the, the, the perspective of some of the uh, medical players that are going to tell you, well, the reason why uh, the cost of healthcare system in the U.S. is 18% is because the healthcare system in the U.S. has been funding innovation. And, and, where, uh, and where Indian players can develop a stand for less than 50 bucks today, it's because for many years, Medtronic has invested in R&D, and, so, so, and, and, and they made those losses in the innovation, and the cost of bringing a new, pharma, a new drug to market is well in excess of, of 50 billion. If you look at Medtronic um, pacemakers, it's 20-year-old technology. I know. And the there's, IP there's has only, gone. There's only three, three players, and... By my estimation, as, as your uh, forensic cost accountant here, it doesn't cost them more than $80 to make <laughs> a pacemaker. Um, but yet, they, I think the lowest price is 2000 I, 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 I yeah. agree, yeah? I, I agree. But my, my point is, is, because you were mentioning 30%, 38% gross margin, I think with 38% gross margins, you are not going to fund innovation in the long run. Uh, I've developed many products on a very low budget that have novel IP and that, that, don't, that, that, that don't have the same R&D cost that the industry claims is de rigor. So I think a lot of it is hyperinflated and, and hyped. Uh, I think that, that there was some, some major uh, review done on how much does it cost to really develop a pharmaceutical. The industry says it's a billion dollars when in fact it's really about 250 million, and most, most of those drugs are gleaned from NIH-supported research uh, where, where industry buys it for very little. 
Uh, and then, so the U.S. taxpayer gets to pay twice, both to develop the drug and then to purchase it. There's probably a whole lot of low-cost innovation that can happen along the drug discovery, like clinical trials, for instance, and using mobile technology to lower the cost of clinical trials. There's probably a whole lot of innovation that can lower the cost of development um, as well. Yeah. Any other? <clears throat> so I think there's a question here, and then here, and then here. Oh. Okay. Uh, Pay Emerson from Sweden, a country well known for its welfare system. Uh, I think we spend about 10% of GDP on healthcare. Yes. <laughs> We've gone through a very dramatic change during the last 30 years in moving from a system where no one had a right to choose a doctor or a hospital to a system where you have personal choice within the framework of a system which is paid for by taxes. Problem 95% is taxes. Now there is an interesting debate. What happens when people like to spend more on healthcare? Uh, do something extra? That is not allowed in Sweden, basically. So my question to you is, what trends do you see long term uh, in the development in various parts of the world? Are we moving to a system where more private money will go into healthcare? Or are we preserving universal healthcare system uh, where it's being paid for by taxpayers. What trends do you see? Well, I, I can share, sorry, I can, <laughs> okay, share, I can share one uh, research evidence with you. And two economists in the United States <coughs> conducted very solid research uh, for the prediction of healthcare in the United States as percentage of GDP by 2050. Now guess what? You think 18% of GDP on healthcare is too much today? And these two economists named Robert Hall and Charles Jones, both at Stanford, show that by 2050, at least 30% of GDP will be spent optimally on population health. Now they give a very, uh, important argument for such a prediction. They believe as the world becomes more and more uh, wealthy with more resources, people cannot keep spending too much on many other things like how much we can eat, how much clothes we can have, how much cars we can drive. There is a diminishing return to uh, the use of almost everything except health. What's our age, our life expectancy reach 90, do we reduce our effort to make uh, things possible to survive for one more year? We may not reduce our efforts. As a result, the whole world will spend more and more on health. Now, um, I think to answer your question, then, who should pay? Private sector, individuals, or government? According to our research, the research we conducted, okay, we find if government spend public finance for health care, okay? That would create more job positions, create more a higher employment in the, in, the, in the macro economy. So if that's something we, are, we, 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 we care about, it, so we may want to promote more public financing. Now I want to just make one last point. Since we're talking about the cost of care, everybody saying, well, we spend too much, okay? I think we have to think about the value of investment in health, okay? First of all, healthcare is part of the economy. It's a zero-sum game. It's in the economy, okay? Let's put that aside. But in addition, we find that if we spend every 10% in healthcare market in the long run, based on 21 APEC country data for the past 40 years, we find for every 10% increase in healthcare per capita, that would lead to about 5% in GDP per capita. That means as long as healthcare does not account for more than 50% of GDP, we gain in economic performance. So if we really want to know the relationship between health and economy, and you said you, you participated in that session earlier, I wish I was in that session. I can share that data with them. I just report that data to the APEC, uh, APEC meeting two weeks ago. In other words, for every 10% increase 
in healthcare spending per capita. That will lead to about 5% in GDP per capita. So as long as healthcare does not account for more than 50% of GDP, we gain economically. That's a pretty amazing algorithm. <laughs> uh, you've got that. You can create a map. You can create an app around uh, that one. Any other comments to that question? Of, I think I would, there was, I, I, on. One, one quick comment on, on this. In both the United States and in China, the consumer pays quite a bit of the health care cost. And one of the interesting things we're seeing, a trend that we're seeing in the United States, where the employer also pays a substantial portion of health care costs, is the employers are thinking about sort of defined contributions. So let's take colonoscopies, for example, in New York City, where the price variation is unbelievable. It is low as $740 at the low end for a colonoscopy, all the way up to $8,500 for a routine and arguably commoditized service where there is no real variation in quality. So what explains that difference? And so a growing number of employers are saying, well, let's look at the market and figure out an average and hand those dollars over to their employee and say, if you want to have a colonoscopy that costs over $8,000, we'll only reimburse you at this level and you, you eat the rest. And if you want to do it for less than the average, then you get to keep some of the savings. And so we're seeing some interesting things around defined contributions. For, sorry, I think for most of emerging country, you ask the questions who pay, but uh, like a country like China, we ask pay to who? So the reason is, uh, there's very limited uh, account of services for healthcare. Of course, we know the government pays something like in hospital, but you really want to use your personal money to buy. It's very hard to buy. So I think that's another kind of, uh, you know, uh, the thing uh, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Yu's comments is uh, we must be leverage the government funding and private funding to work together to solve healthcare problem. It's coming from the government. I think uh, the government has got multiple responsibilities, and health is not the only area sure. in which the government funding has to be given to. So I think it is a it's a difficult issue. I mean, the, how high, if it's like the Swedish example, the Malaysian example is also uh, the public service is paid through general taxation. How high, how high are we going to increase general taxes to meet up to the increasing needs and uh, what is that? The impact of that is going to be the uh, consumption ability of the population at large. So these are balances which we have to make. I think eventually what governments have probably to decide is uh, what are the essential components of the health care which should be provided by the state and which are the components which probably has to be met by the individual. And uh, drawing this line will be an in inevitable line by virtue of the economics of the entire world. And what is, what is public and what is private? What are public goods yeah. and, and what are private goods in that, in that equation? I think we had a comment um, here, a question here. Yes, uh, following on the comment on that we have to take care of the patients but also of the non-patients, mm. the, the population that doesn't use healthcare, what's your take on the role of insurance? or particularly private insurance or fund pooling in uh, controlling healthcare costs around the world? Well, I can only speak for uh, the Chinese situation. According to the official documentation issued by Chinese State Council, uh, when we start, off, start offering health services, including medical care, but uh, but also other non-medical uh, non care services like for health maintenance, health management. The state council documentation says we should encourage or promote the role of commercial insurance programs first for some years, and then perhaps the state-led insurance programs will kick in to pay more and more later. So the current, the current um, uh, policy uh, design is to have private insurance to play a greater role in the beginning. 
That's uh, the situation in, in China based on the, the official documentation. To, to just look at another perspective, whether private insurance in itself can assist in the element of prevention uh, as it does for, for the management of uh, disease. I think there are very few insurance companies which actually fund preventive programs as part of the insurance mechanism. Uh, a lot of them don't even put uh, screening, uh, normal screening into the scheme. But I think one which has been coming off is uh, uh, dis dis uh, dis uh, disincentives uh, given to, to, to uh, high-risk behavior. Uh, in, in, virtue, in, 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 in terms of premium. Uh, that might be one component which might actually promote, I mean, we are trying how to trigger the behavioral change towards health, whether that can be one component which can be contributory. Yeah. Well, as Choice an man. insurance representative, <laughs> I can assure you that we think long and hard about the role of prevention. Um, you know, Aetna, our own employees, you know, we take metabolic syndrome tests and get refunds on our premiums if we pass metabolic, sy the met metabolic syndrome test. And we roll out disease management programs across the country and increasingly across the world. And also investing heavily in health information technology because we see the promise both in eliminating waste and encouraging this transformation from a system that's primarily based on disease. treatment of disease right. to one that can facilitate and promote Promotional wellness. Yeah. And so we very much, you know, as we think about our future role around the world, and right. certainly in the United States, we're transforming ourselves to have that very orientation around wellness. Right. Very good. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question over here before we wrap up. Hi, my name is Kumar. We just heard about the conversation on continuum of health and breaking silos talked about the monopolies and how you know people are charging what they want because and of course the investments being made behind those uh, uh, research and that's the reason why it's so expensive um, and you also heard about the fact that the the, the, the consumer at the end of the day uh, can make choices about you know what they have to do but the information is not always available to consumers what choices they can make what is generic what is uh, and of course providers and of course, uh, hospitals and doctors always want to make sure people, patients come to hospital, otherwise how will they make money? But the role of government, the question therefore is probably to, and I don't know how, uh, what is the policy or what is this thinking of governments today to give more information out there. All the information is already there, also maybe not available to a patient or a customer when they want it, to know specifically something about health, how to prevent something from happening. So what is the role that governments and agencies who support, you know, not-for-profit others, coming together to do something really uh, to prevent and manage wellness instead of going to hospitals. And also informing people about where you can you have to pay, end up paying more money for colonoscopy as opposed to you can pay less. Why wouldn't we put all the information out there for people to make choices and become aware of what is to be done to take care of themselves much more than what's being done today and what's the government's doing about it? I think in a situation where there is reimbursement to such payment from the state, uh, they have systems in which uh, this information is available because uh, at the end of the day, the state reimburses the cost of going to whichever doctor which is there. But unfortunately, in our system, we don't have <coughs> these reimbursements. So uh, those who come into the public service are taken completely care by the uh, public service. And the private sector is a market-driven entity where the individuals make the choice. Uh, like in Malaysia, I've started, I have started uh, uh, triggering off the creation of very strong consumer health groups. While you have consumer groups which take care of, uh, of products, for example, of food prices or other things, there are very few active consumer health groups which actually fight uh, for optimal market <coughs> of uh, health care like what we are saying. So as a result of which the health market has been completely unregulated, both by the policymakers and also by the consumers themselves by virtue of pressure. So I think there is a need for consumers to organize themselves into pressure groups which will actually cause this change. And they can, they can create this empowerment within society uh, to make sure people can make the right choices. Uh, so the government could be the trigger force uh, to, to, to create such a fire. That will be the strongest entity. 
I, I, I think the government can really make a first call to, in, to uh, create the environment yeah. conditions. Government can make a first call to uh, issue policies to encourage uh, market to respond. Yeah. I th but I think the central driving force mm -hmm. for such a healthy product for the health population have to come from market forces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So every, everyone over here, if you're interested in health product market, now you're most welcome to China to do the business. <laughs> so don't just focus on medical care, but health products. That's what most needed in China, which has a huge business. Yeah. Very good. I thought it was a terrific place to finish. The government, the market. Yeah. You know, um, thank you all very, very much uh, for your contributions. I think it's been a great panel. I've certainly learned a lot. And thank you to the audience um, as well for all of your, all of your contributions. Thank you.